All right, let's get started here. This tutorial of um, how to use my game demo. I've been getting some questions uh, on Facebook. Of course, this is me. Oh yeah, I'm the ultra supreme eccentrical guardian. You can see that. Uh, anyway, all right. I had an idea a few years back, it was almost about four years ago in September of 2008 for a uh, Galaga or a, um, a top screen shoot 'em up type of game. Just some something simple to start with. Um, to do a simple game I figured that'd be easy and I got this idea from whenever uh, I parked my car near a tree and birds pooped all over it and it reminded me of this old episode of the monsters today I think it was in which grandpa says bats don't poop on cars uh, so I decided to I just drew some sprites you know I drew a car and a bird and, and that's about it and then and that idea set for about three years until I um, Got um, until I start until I found out about Pygame and how simple that would be. Just using the Python scripting language combined with uh, SDL, like a abstraction layer and so forth, and to make it all simple. Okay, my uh, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, my uh, Facebook page for the game called Danger from Above. Now this right here, if you're looking at it where my mouse cursor is, that's just concept art. That's not how the game looks. Hopefully the game looks better than that. I drew all this myself using GIMP. Uh, I can't remember if I done it in Windows or Linux. It didn't matter. This here, this is the uh, little <laughs> mascot guy. It's, uh, it's a blue jay. I don't have a name for him yet, but I, I chose a blue jay because they're a nice looking bird and they're also known to be among the most mischievous types of birds and it's appropriate for uh, pooping on cars on the roads and uh, causing wrecks. Now this here development screenshot is an actual screenshot from the game so far, but there's a motorcycle in here, it's yellow and it might not be in the version of the script that um, that that you might see uh, all, along with this grassy background. I think all you'll really see is like a car and a truck. That's about it. And you'll see his bird and just follows mouse cursor. Uh, a lot of this was done using Linux or that operating system because it's just my favorite. Uh, pretty much almost all the artwork was done. Well, a lot of the artwork was done in GIMP. Um, but also uh, Pixel Toolbox. It's a little program from Axiom and it's a Windows program but I run it in Linux through Wine. I drew the bird using that method. I drew the cars. Um, it's just really good for spriting applications. Just the way it lets you zoom in and see things. I mean it could be done in GIMP but it was, it's just I like that little you know stuff you make little tiles in. Game demo version 9.0C, October 2011. And there's a reason why I chose that name. Um, the actual version of the game is 0.0.5 um, because that is a, uh, a realistic version number since not very much is going on with the game. Um, and but if you remember the history of uh, Microsoft and when they were doing the uh, bi monthly releases for DirectX 9.0C, it was just really ridiculous because they kept the name 9.0C, you know, the 9.0. Well, they started out, it started out like, I don't know, it was like 2003 or whatever with version 9.0 of DirectX, their uh, multimedia API or whatever. It's a lot of times it's used for games, but other people can use it for other things. <clears throat> uh, it covers input such as m uh, mice, keyboards, it handles audio, handles uh, uh, 
the things to do with graphics, uh, uh, visual rendering. And uh, so anyway, they got up to version 9.0. Well, instead of changing it to 9.2 later on, whenever they did something, or going to 9.7 or whatever, no, Microsoft, being a corporation like they are, just like uh, uh, America Online back in 2003, 2004, they loved to keep calling it 9.0. Both of them companies did that. They were notorious. They kept the version number 9.0, even though they kept releasing new editions, new versions. But with Microsoft, they they had 9.0 and then 9.0A, 9.0B, 9.0C. Then they kept the 9.0C uh, version naming because apparently they thought it sounded great. And they kept making changes and updates to it but they broke away from the normal version naming of software and um, they called it, uh, they kept calling it 9.0C and here's my website that I made a while back uh, where you can get the game and I need to update all this, I I've just been lazy or busy with other projects and um, so anyway, oh yeah I stretched this image up so, so it would pixelate and look like a video game because it because it's supposed to, and um, so anyway, and then they uh, so it's 9.0 C April 2004, 9.0 C April two uh, or uh, uh, June 2004, and they did this all the way up through like 2006. So like version 9.0 C October 2005. You know, 9.0 C, uh, December 2005, February 2006. It's ridiculous, and they did this for at least two years. Just, oh my gosh, it was so retarded. So I chose to mock that <laughs> with my stuff. Here, as I start out, as soon as I got something that would just, as soon as I was working with Pi Game and got something that would display on the screen and follow a mouse cursor and do whatever, anything. I immediately called it 9, you know, it's version number 9.0C. And then I would like, whatever different day that I added a piece of code in there, even if it was like two or three lines. And then I would redistribute this uh, or post it up on the website. I would call it version 9.0C third week of September 2011 and just kept with the ridiculous naming that was the air conditioner that kicked on but uh, I kept up with the ridiculous naming so people in the public get the I they, they get an understanding of how ridiculous Microsoft is about stuff um, people have noticed when you click on uh, if you see the URL here down the bottom uh, click on the link it just brings up the Python script this is what the source code looks like um, most people, I guess, are accustomed to uh, Windows, the Windows world where everything is just dumb or whatever. I used to be like that. I used to use Windows for a long time and I got off that. What you're supposed to do is right click on this and save the link as. Um, there's a readme file, change log. I need to keep up with the change log. Um, and. Uh, Here's the story here of it. I need to just, uh, I just need to keep everything all good. You can download the uh, game content. It's a zip file. All it is just all the pictures and stuff. Now what I've done is, a lot of people they got their uh, their comments in here. You know, can you share code? <laughs> I said, I guess there's not much code to share. <laughs> and. Um, this is why I said the graphics are not good. And I said, of course, because they were quickly done without much effort. I just wanted to get something done quickly. Uh, sorry, I do not like game programming. Why? It, I don't know. Maybe I just get fascinated by stuff and I let my curiosity pull me along and be my motivation or whatever. It's like, but you can share about algorithms and how to handle them. Like, well... I don't know a whole bunch about that. I'm just anyway. Uh, 
yeah, I know C++ is really good for computer games, but I don't know how to program in C++. I got a bunch of books for the C programming language. I just, I don't know, I feel kind of ashamed because I don't take it very seriously. Anyway, um, yeah, I clicked on the download link. There's only a page of the Pi code. How can I play it? Well, right click, save as, blah, blah. Somebody's like, you know, can you put an exe file or something to run? I'm like, well, there's Pi to exe, but, you know, I don't use Windows. So, anyway, finally, I just settled it. I just took all the game content with the, um, with the code and I uh, put it into a zip file so all you need is just uh, uh, just extract this archive and everything should be all there and then you get Genie which is a nice little program I've been using it for gosh like a year or whatever I, I use Linux uh, in case you notice this is not Microsoft Windows I can't stand Windows, even though I used to like it for several years because I didn't know any better. And Linux is really good right now. This is Linux Mint 13, based off Ubuntu 12.04 long-term support LTS. Uh, I like it quite a bit. And this is the Cinnamon graphical interface, which is the Linux Mint uh, team. It's their answer to the GNOME 3 shell. Uh, Inter, you know, graphical interface. The GNOME 3 shell, I kind of liked it at first, but I was so accustomed to the GNOME panel, like the way things were done in GNOME 2, uh, version 2 of GNOME, and um, I, I really liked how you can lock things to the panel, and it was just nice, which this functionality here, I'm going to show something. Oh, where do I, what do I want to put onto the panel? There, there was um, that functionality is basically still here. Uh, let's see, some I don't have. Okay, GIMP, because I'm probably gonna edit images. You just you know hover your mouse over it, find it, right click, add to panel. This is that same feature that was in GNOME version two with you know the GNOME panel. And so with this Cinnamon interface for Linux Mint. Uh, you get so many of the features that are new and good about GNOME 3, but also you get what's good about GNOME version 2. And it's just, I really like it. I think it was a good way to go. And uh, programming, I already got that set up. What else do I want to add in there since I'm doing stuff? Um, I don't know. But anyway, cinnamon. I really like. I really like it. Uh, I really like uh, Linux Mint. Pretty good. Sabion version eight was pretty good. I liked it. Uh, it ran on <laughs> a piece of older hardware that uh, none of the other Linux distros will run on. Uh, it was MT Paint. Might as well lock that to the panel. I'll put that on there, and then you got all this, and you just quick launch it and it's great I highly recommend it so anyway this program called Genie and um, so I'm going to tab here using the keyboard command don't got to do a whole bunch of mouse clicks like everybody else likes to do G-A-N-Y that's what I'm going to search for and I got Firefox all set up the way I like it and I just select the search engine go to it yeah um, when did they start that? Oh, it was back in 2005. The reason why I recommend Genie is because you can handle a whole bunch of programming languages. You'll do C and a bunch of derivatives of C, uh, Java, and then JavaScript, PHP, HTML. So you can write web pages with it, uh, cascading style sheets. I use it for Python. You can do Perl, Ruby, all kind of other stuff. It's a nice, lightweight, little integrated development environment. Uh, and the good thing is, you can use it in BSD, Linux, Mac OS, Solaris, and Windows. People should use this. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. It's one program that you can get accustomed to. 
and it'll run on practically anything that you would have so y you can run it on like well you can run uh, you can run Genie on a, an ARM Acorn Risk Machines microprocessor somebody did that in a video on YouTube uh, because Linux runs on ARM and uh, therefore you use it's, it's this one nice little program you can get accustomed to and take it with you wherever you want to go. They might even have a portable version of it. Uh, portable apps. Uh, if they got a portable version of it, oh, I'm going to be so good or so happy. But this is compiled for Windows. Yep, they got it. Genie Portable. You can uh, install that thing to a USB flash drive, plug it into anybody's Windows computer, and uh, write your software and do whatever. And it's all great, but you can probably do the same thing with Linux also. It's just like uh, zero install or something like that. But yeah, there's uh, you can see that it's portableapps.com forward slash apps forward slash development forward slash G E A N Y underscore portable. That's where you find it. It just I mean there's so many nice and neat convenient little ways to do things with free open source software, Linux and so forth, and it's very easy. I'm not a guru. I've written a very small amount of programming um during my lifetime. I mean look, like here's my most recent programming stuff. And this is just stuff that came from a tutorial, and I just played around with it. And I felt like it was like doing web design. Other than that, you know, I've, uh, I've, uh, where did I just do it here? Things have changed in Firefox since I started using it a while back. I wrote this web page by hand, just wrote the code, the text editor, it's pretty nice. That's how I've done things, but I'm not like some kind of guru, and this stuff's not like really hard. So anyway, grab Genie, uh, install it. Uh, I just recommend the uh, the the version of it that's got GTK 2.16, because most Windows users don't even know what GTK is, but Genie needs it. Now to make sure you have it. But anyway, it's really great. Now, I'm going to log out of here. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Um, whenever I go, I'm probably going to, if I if I start up a company or a software development group team, whatever, some entity that I, you know, work for, with, or whatever, it's going to be called... Beagle Botics. <laughs> oh, it's a name that I just, I was thinking of some kind of name that sounded goofy and stupid while at the same time kind of sounded cool and that my friend Dylan would uh, like. And apparently he liked it. You know, I was I was trying to get his input, but I hadn't heard from him for a while. So uh, I was trying to come up with a name. So like you always see this, like uh, U.S. Robotics and other company names like that that sound all technical and they sound all significant and wonderful and all that. So I come up with a couple days ago on the on July 29th I came up with Beaklebotics. <laughs> Something um, you just you don't know about the beak and what the beak represents or anything like that but I don't know m most people won't. So anyway Beaklebotics is a computer systems and software development organization founded by myself, Christian Noggle. Uh, of course, going by the handle Beak Supreme. Uh, that has many meanings and references, <clears throat> of which to uh, a comedy movie it came out several years ago. Anyway, I did it in July of 2012. Actually, I had these concepts before that. I just finally now got around to coming up with a name for a group or organization or whatever. Okay, the mission. Beaglebotics' goals are to develop experimental arcade and game console systems that utilize GNU Linux operating systems, cross-platform software development, original in-house games, 
and energy efficient gaming platforms. BeagleBotics also partners with EMOBC for influence in game planning and design consultation. BeagleBotics is a computer system and software development organization that specializes in entertainment oriented computerized systems that make, of the GNU, that make use of the GNU Linux operating system uh, software platform because that's my favorite. Now, that's what it'd be like, because I've been wanting to make arcade machines for five years. I've been wanting to make a, a two-dimensional side-scrolling game for almost seven years now. Definitely for six. And that brings up another thing. Uh, one of my websites. I got several websites. I had to make a website to keep a list of all my websites. So we got... Uh, We got this here, and this keeps track of my gaming stuff. Oh yeah, I didn't know. Well, I suspected since somebody could change the width of an HR, horizontal row or whatever that horizontal line in HTML, and I wrote all this code by hand. Figured, well, if somebody is, is able to change the width of it, why couldn't they change the color of it? So I tried the experiment. Yeah, I got it red up here. I got it purple over here. What is that sound? Anyway, it sounded like a dog peeing on the floor, but there's no dogs in here. So anyway, um, I don't know, maybe it's tape curling off of something. Uh, it's just weird. So anyway, I got all these, and it's kind of hard to see on here. It's kind of strange. But I got some of my game page uh, pages. I got my uh, Maniac Mansion uh, fan site. Now this here, this picture, I did not draw this. This was taken from a uh, from the actual game itself. But I drew the star background here, and I chose the colors and all that. Optimized it for 288k dial-up because that's what it'll work for. Um, I did not draw this plant. It's just a sprite rip from a game. Oh, that's a bug over there. I know what it is. This stupid moths are in here. It's dumb. Just flapping along the wall. There it is up there. See it? And then this clock, I did not draw that. It's a sprite rip from the actual game. But I did draw the chainsaw several years ago, just playing around in GIMP, uh, which is like a free open source alternative to Adobe Photoshop. I did not draw this. I took that from the uh, Scum VM website. Now these two pieces of artwork, I did draw these. Uh, the one on the left, I drew it in some drawing program. I forget which one. I think it was like soft keys, uh, photo finish, it's an old program. This one here, I, I like it. The one on the right that's uh, pixelated. I did that in, um, what was it? Um, pix uh, pixel Toolbox. And this straight up looks like something you'd see on Super Nintendo and it's just really good. And I really liked it. Uh, so I'm proud of myself. And uh, I created this this, this uh, web page here, this site, to keep track of every version of the game. It took me one and a half years to find every version of Maniac Mansion, the first one, uh, on the internet. I combed the internet and I put all of them up on my server. I got them all here for anybody that wants them. I have not received takedown orders yet. Nobody said anything to me. No company is claiming copyright infringement or whatever and it's not like I'm selling the stuff or whatever and hey you know what it's their fault for not making the stuff publicly available on the market for me to purchase or for anybody else to pur uh, purchase they've abandoned the game I'm not modifying it or whatever of course I'd like to remake the game and so forth but you know hey it's their fault for not putting it back on the market and making it for sale like how uh, ID or id software does which they're always good you can always buy even their oldest games and they sell them for a fairly cheap price and it's great. Anyway, I like this artwork, you know, Pi game, Python SDL. It's what I did my uh, game demo in. Uh, this one of my pages here. Now, uh, taking out a tour. Oh, all right. Okay, I did that. Rocketeer, this is just a. These are all sprite rips. Um, everything. I, I didn't draw any of this here. I just put it all together and just because I liked how the game looked and I was just going to feature pictures from it. Um, <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This is all entirely sprite rips. 
I did not draw any of this, not even this. I just put all this in here because it looks good. And I, I like themed web pages, you know, like shrine kind of stuff. Like, uh, I'll show you an example. Castle. I just go to Castlevania 3 site. Um, here yeah yeah this site here this is not mine I don't know who this belongs to uh, I just love it when people theme their websites very thoroughly in something whether it's a in this case a video game or sometimes a TV show or whatever and they do really good and uh, Uh, this one was pretty good, but I think he changed it a little bit. Whoa, that's weird. Um, is this a website or what? Symphony of the Night. I really liked that game. It, it was like the gold standard of how I think uh, video games should be uh, should be made. Castlevania Ring. Search Castlevania. Come on, bring up this stuff. P's Castlevania, whatever. Come on, bring up the website I want to see. Uh, Castlevania Realm. Ah, here we go. Here's something. This was probably Sprite Rips right here. Most like, I mean, it's possible somebody could have redrew all of it, but I don't know. Oh, this, this is, oh, this is Symphony of the Night. Alright, I'm going to bookmark this. And, uh, yeah, this is they, this is straight out of Castlevania Symphony of the Night right here. These uh, and this is the first Castlevania, and then this is Symphony of the Night, and, and I don't know which one that's from, but I, I just really like that artwork, and this is very well themed. Um, and I just really uh, I like it, and it's just. Do you see what I'm talking about now? These are the shrine sites, and they're so great. And I tried to imitate that. Um, here's the arcade gaming shrine site that I did. Um, I just took in the background here, it's just screenshots from some of my favorite arcade games. I just collaged them together or whatever, and had to darken them so you can see text over them better. I drew this arcade machine here, and then I... I I expanded the size of it so that it would pixelate and so also it's bigger and covers more screen area but I, I wanted it to pixelate so you would notice how that looks and I chose the colors this kind of reminds me of like some kind of vanilla ice cream and this reminds me of indigo it's a nice little pretty almost like fluorescent orange and I, I, I got the graphics gamepad pro it's really good uh, those are highly coveted I mean, they're almost worth body parts to people. Because <laughs> a couple friends of mine, they got those, and I've offered money, and they would not sell them. Even though they don't use them very often, they still will not sell them, and I don't blame them, because I got mine, and I wish I would have bought some more. They were like, I don't know, 20 bucks or whatever back in 2000. They, they plug up through USB. They're very simple for the operating system to... Uh, to use. Uh, they're basically the style of a PlayStation controller. They're comfortable, they're nice, <clears throat> and they're a nice piece of equipment. And the company that made them is out of business. They don't exist anymore. So if you get one of these things, they're pretty rare and they're highly coveted. Now there's a white version of this that plugs up through the original MIDI or game port to sound cards, which doesn't exist anymore. So those aren't as valuable even though they're older. Uh, it's the USB version that even though this device might be 12 or 13 years old, you can use it on even the newest computers. So, and, and USB will presumably always be around. And so um, these things are very valuable and I, I chose these colors here because they look nice. 
Oh yeah, Ninja Turtles from 1989. One of my most favorite games of all time. It was so great. Second one was pretty good. Robocop, I really liked it. Um, Narc was alright. It was the first to use, what is it? Um, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, I think it was, let's see. Um, 14 bit color. No, was it? No, no, no. It's it 13, yeah. Because 12 bits is 4,096 colors. And NARC had a palette of uh, 8,192, so that's, uh, that's 13 bit. And up until its time, it was the, it was the best. Uh, this Battletoads game is pretty cool. Metal Slug is very hard to beat. This game came out in 1996, which was basically at the end of the Sprite era when everything was going to 3D polygons, uh, polygons, and this just kept up with the, with the tradition. It looked like Super Nintendo on steroids. Well, not as much as Castlevania Symphony of the Night, but it was still good. It was a really good game series. They carried it all, all the way up to 2006, and it, and it looks like, I, I don't know if this is true, but it, it at least looks like it was the same developers involved, the same artists, the same, you know, whatever the case may be, because the game design pretty much all looked the same, but they just had different levels and different characters and all that. Uh, Contra was good. Night Slashers actually had good artwork in it. I really liked it. Burger Time, the way they drew these burgers even back then, 30 years ago in 1982. Uh, it always makes me hungry because they just they really make them look good. Joe and Mac had some good graphics. I like the color. X-Men arcade game from 20 years ago in 1992 was really nice. Final Fight, nice city scenes and all that. Um, I chose these pictures because they... I, these I try to get picture screenshots that kind of define how the game looks and excellent examples of game design. This scene here from Mercs, I mean you can't see its motion, but they got the parallax scroll uh, scrolling going on and it's just breathtaking. I mean, and this game is 22 years old. It's from 1990. This game it just it looks really nice as you as your character moves across up here. And then this, this background moves very slowly and this foreground moves faster. And Parallax scrolling is really awesome. I really like it. And I think that, you know, two-dimensional graphics, but using parallax layers or scrolling layers just looks really nice. Um, and I want to bring that back. Uh, this, this had some good artwork on there. Uh, killer list of video games. I didn't make this one, I don't know who did it, but it's just, it's a really nice one. Um, it's like the internet movie database of, um, of arcade games. Now this site here, this is back on mine, you can see the, uh, you know, Christian Noggle, that's me, and my favorite arcade games. I'll show you some entries, you can see, uh, Killer List of Video Game, uh, you know, Killer List of Video Games, they got the arcade machine here, you can see it tells information about it. it, even shows you what the printed circuit board looks like, the uh, arcade motherboard. One of these here is, uh, it should be, I don't know if it's a Motorola 68000, those were common um, yeah, for a CPU and then a bunch of ROM chips for the game and all this other stuff, and uh, this game came out in 1989, so, uh, <laughs> this is weird. Um, Oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, they just show you what it looks like. Here's screenshots. Here's a uh, video gameplay. And, uh, oh, I, re I really like this. It, it was really well made. 1,024 colors is what it has. I don't even know if this is showing up for you because of how video output gets the way it is programmed and all that embedded video. But anyway, the microphone probably picks up the sound, so there's proof that the video is actually playing. And, uh, so anyway, here's screenshots from it. You can buy, you can buy the arcade machine. I think that looks like Simpsons there. 
It's one of my favorites. I like to have this. I got the game on uh, Nintendo NES. I got the cartridge. And actually, I got the first three Ninja Turtle games on the NES. The actual physical cartridges. And uh, this is just really neat. And it's just well designed. And it's one of my favorites. And I, and I contacted Konami, the company that makes that game. And I told them how awesome the game is how much I liked it and they're like oh we're so glad that you like it and then I mentioned to them that I wish that they would make some more two dimensional games like that but, but then their response is well we don't think they'll sell and I'm like oh that's terrible it's just sad anyway so that's that um, then uh, oh gosh in case you've seen this diet monitor Dr. Robert Atkins I drew this art myself I took a picture off the web and <laughs> changed Bob Atkins. <laughs> I drew these items here back in 2006. Sprite art. And, uh, oh yeah, he's Hitler. And uh, I drew this back in 2004. The keyboard with hands. and did this back in 2004. I really need to update my websites. So many links went dead. Uh, a story I came up with, you don't even want to know. You, you, you just don't. It's like really hardcore. And I got this motherboard in one of my computers, 1.5 gigahertz, 32-bit, single thread, single core, via C7, comparable to about like a Pentium M, you know, a little more powerful than a Pentium 3, but not quite as powerful as a Pentium 4. I actually have this case and it looks just like that, but I don't have that keyboard. Here's the specs online. Got you know, gig of RAM, which is the maximum I could get. 100 gig hard drive. It's pretty much the largest capacity they had back then. And I spent like seven hundred some odd dollars on that. I still got it. I was planning on using it for an arcade machine because it's got all these video outputs. You got your composite, you got your stereo audio, uh, and then you uh, you got your uh, your component video there. And it's not very loud, but anyway, um, links. Yeah, it's that. oh yeah, build your own arcade wiki. Excuse me. Anyway, I know this is just getting really... Oh, yeah, game influences. Yeah, this is where I actually got the idea to do that arcade gaming shrine. And this is from my site here. And I just... And I didn't make any of these games. I just put them all on there. I just show various um, screenshots from games that I like. And uh, the art style. I'll let you see that. Uh, the Rocketeer, that was really good. I like night scenes. I also like sunsets. Um, I like greenery, as you can see, Super Castlevania 4. Uh, just various. You'll you'll notice some of the pictures, some of the screenshots are familiar. I reused them again in my arcade gaming shrine. Vice Project Doom is kind of a neat game. Um, I'm just letting the uh, the page scroll for you to see it. Uh, but in the arcade gaming shrine, I did not use all these pictures um, because not all those were arcade games. Batman Returns is really good. Just, they, they really made that good. Uh, that, it was on Super Nintendo, but the Super Nintendo version was rated the best out of all the different ports of it, whether it was the Sega CD or the Sega Genesis or the NES or anything like that. Contra 3 has yeah, some neat. You can see lighting effects, primitive types of lighting effects on the Super Nintendo done there. They they also use some transparency effects a little bit. They try to imitate that. Um, it's pretty much all that. Source of influence. Tool choices listed. Yeah, Gap and blah, blah, blah. Game engines, blah. Uh, weapons and power-ups. Now, this is all my sprite art. And a collapsible baton, I drew that back in like 2006. And it was just neat. This stuff, I, I drew these sprites with a pixel toolbox. I'll actually just bring it Axiom A X I O M P I X E M. Yeah, here it is, the website right here. And this is actually a nice little program. I mean, I, I don't really like using Windows software because everything it's always about pay me money or I'll cripple your program and it's all dumb and and like it just oh gosh anyway but it'll run all the way back to Windows 95 <laughs> that's cool this program is useful 
Uh, I do like it. And uh, do they even do they even sell it? Like, are they are they charging money for it or not? Because um, if they're charging money for it, I probably need to. I've used it so much, I probably need to pay some money. Um, software, I mean, like Pixel Toolbox. It uh, doesn't act like they're selling it. Oh well. All right, I do. Yeah, this collapsed all the time. And I did this flashing. Oh, I loved it back in games during the late '80s and early '90s. They just cycle through like five colors that were the easiest colors to memorize the values of. I'll show you what I'm talking about. You get red from okay. If you okay, this stuff. If you're doing 24-bit color, if that's your color, you know, display. And all that that gives you sixteen million seven hundred seventy-seven thousand two hundred sixteen colors, um, because it's basically two to the sixteenth power, um, and you divide up the twenty-four bits amongst three colors that gives you eight bits per color, and so each color is represented in two nibbles or two hexadecimal values. So you go FF the mat, which you know in hexadecimal F is the maximum value of something. In hexadecimal, zero is the minimal value. So you go maximum red, minimum green. The next two two zeros are for green, and uh, and uh, and minimal value of blue. So it just gives you straight pure red. Um, now, if you want to do cyan, right there, maximum to the far left, you got maximum value of uh, red. Zero value of green, maximum value of blue. Another color they use, is, well, we'll do blue. F F F F. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Zero 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 zero. F F. That's maximum color blue. Uh, blue is your last two values there. They're set in F. Uh, basically, the value of you know, 255, which is the, the 256th. Anyway, number in there, but anyway, you know, zero counts as a one as the first value, which it means zero, but it's counted as the first value. 255, it's the 256th value, but it counts as 255. Anyway, um, so that's blue right there. Um, well, I'll show you. I'll, I'll just show you this way. All right. page right now. All right. Oops. And here's where I do the colors. All right. This tells it we're doing hexadecimal colors. FF0000 will give us red. Um, all right. Okay, six to get it big. We're gonna have this color white just so it always shows up. Um, color equals. F, 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 that's white. Just wrote a web page really quick. We are going to save it as um, oh, we're just gonna start it out. Oh, new folder. Like 
that. It's not a text file. It's all files covered in HTML. Okay, now the um, now this recognizes that uh, that this is HTML code. Hopefully everything's all right. Now what we will do is we'll run this. Um, Colors demo. There we go. There we go. This color's red. That looks looks kind of like cyan. That's weird. Um. Huh. No wonder. All right. Let's see how this looks. Ah, oh, there we go. This color's red for the background. All right, that shows red. Now you want to do cyan. We take out the green here, make them oops zero zero. And this is this should be magenta. All right, we just refresh this. Crap! Oh, the the text is magenta. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, we do. Uh, we're gonna be white. That's embarrassing. Uh, FF. Alright, I did the color wrong. Okay, value. And if you notice, if you compare it, magenta is one of the colors that flashes. Um, okay, so we got red, we got magenta. We will do yellow, which is. Um, okay, we have the, the first two values right here are for red, second two values are for green. And the third two values are blue. So we have maximum red, maximum green, no blue at all. We'll save that. And we will, um, oh, gotta tell it it's yellow. Oops. Yeah, I'm just gotta save that. And, uh, I, yep, there's yellow, uh, because it takes, uh, takes um, maximum, you know, it takes yellow and green, or it takes red and green to make yellow. And I know people dispute this stuff. They're like, no, red and green make brown. Yeah, with ink and paint. But, you know, you need to go take a micro, uh, you need to go take a uh, magnifying glass up to the screen of your monitor or up to the screen of your television or whatever and go look at uh, yellow on there. You'll see red and green. Go look at white. You'll see red, green, and blue. And you'll see all these colors. These there's a difference between light and paint. Okay, that's yellow, and you'll notice that uh, that it's flashing yellow in there. Now another color it flashes is lime. Uh, how you make lime is you just simply have the maximum value of green. So you have zero red, maximum green, zero blue, and. Uh, notice that there's some lime in there, some of that green color. It's lime, because uh, how I did that. And then you refresh this. There's lime. Okay. Now, if you want to have darker green, you just do like um, and uh, green. There you go. You tone it down. You see. What makes it lime color is because it's so bright. Now, let's see. You want cyan, C Y A N. It's another simple value, and these are so easy to do. All right, for cyan, zero red, maximum green, maximum blue. And you'll notice there's cyan in there that's that light blue color. And, um, Oops, went to my home page. This is cyan. So you got um, you got magenta, red, yellow, lime, cyan. And they use magenta kind of like a purple. And uh, then then you got uh, one more color is blue. Just uh, 
Okay, first of all, you have zero, you know, no red at all, no green at all, and then maximum blue. And we'll refresh that. This is blue. Okay, and they use these as common colors in. Uh, when they use these as co common colors in flashing stuff in old uh, video games from the 80s and early 90s. And it consists of just taking this image here and putting a red tint, saving that as the image, um, then a magenta tint, you know, redo the image in magenta, save it, redo it in yellow, save it, keep doing it, and just animate these in the program. And it flashes. These things get your attention. Now, oh yeah, the SA-10. That's actually based on a real weapon. Uh, SA-10. No, I'm not looking for a missile that just... Look for a pistol. Yep, there it is. Um, we'll look at uh, look at pictures of it. Where we find it at. Okay, there's that missile again. You just keep showing up. And this, this little moth thing is right now. Get off of me! I'll freaking kill you. Yeah, you, you've earned it. Yeah. Now, I'm still looking for it in here, and they keep showing the missile. Print article, okay, they don't have it pictured here. Uh, well, they don't have it pictured there either, that's dumb. Um. Uh, It's basically a paintball pistol, and it fires. Uh, they the police use it for pepper balls, and um, y you know what? If if they if they'd show it, P E P E R. Gosh, man! Six years ago, you could easily find this stuff. Where's the SN10? Oh, Tac Force and Automatic. It looks kind of neat. Where's that? Are they not using the SA10 anymore? Anyway, let's look. This is just getting frustrating. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. It's really similar. This is kind of what it looks like. And, um,. They this is a variant of it. Uh, looks pretty tough. Matter of fact, what does that look like? That looks similar to a paintball pistol that I got, even the handle and stuff. But it just looks like a more tactical version of it of the same thing. Looks more cool. Anyway, yeah. Um, no, you get the point. Show his police officer using it. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. You see those uh, those stripes on there, and I, I preserved them on my gun. Basically, my gun looks very similar to the one that's here because I actually spent time looking at it and seeing how it's gonna look. And I drew that. Oh yeah, it's so cool. It's sprite art, you know, pixel art. ATS AT eighty five R. Yeah, uh, ATS AT 85R. And, uh, yeah, you, you still kind of see it here. Basically, how it kind of looks. Well, that's tacked out a little more tactical style. Um, it's a nice little paintball gun I'd like to have. Um, it's a semi-automatic paintball gun, or is it full automatic? But anyway, it's just nice looking, and I drew that years ago for Diet Martyr Project, and they just change different stock configurations. And anyway, yeah, I drew it, and it's 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 awesome. And here's a loaf of bread, yep. And then here's a potato. I drew that. And here's paintballs and. I drew all this Sprite stuff, and habanero pepper, one of my favorites. 
Look at some pixel art. So I actually drew that there. It was great. And I, I just really like this stuff. People have to think this stuff out, and it's just it's just great. Um, man, things have changed in six years. Spriting. Oh, can you believe somebody actually drew this here? In video games, 20 years ago, that's how they used to look. 20, you know, 25, 30 years ago. Somebody's got some really good artistic skill. I admire that. It's great. So anyway, um, there's that artwork that I did. Um, <laughs> calculated audio data rates. I need to rework this and come out with a more simple formula. 8,192 uh, 8, bits in a kilobyte. I just did this project one day. Yeah, October 21st, 2006. Yeah, I was calculating up data rates for what I'd want to have in a game. Game enemies, okay, yeah. Uh, game art. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do use these potted plants and all that kind of stuff. Put it in there. Uh, I used a 3D modeling program to recreate a scene in uh, this here, and I, I did all this kind of stuff there. Um, idealistic. Production ideas, yeah, port it to like everything. Game feature ideas, parallax scrolling, yeah, lighting, particle effects, lens flare, reflections, fog, garage shading, fong shading, translucence, uh, transparent levels. Yeah, just Castlevania Symphony Night is so awesome. So you can see the transparency levels in there to simulate, you know, uh, seeing through water and they got shadow kind of stuff, and it's just really cool. And it was it was just really great. And you don't even want to know about the story. It's horrible. I mean, like it, it's it's hardcore. And um, oh gosh, and where did I have this um, story and plot? No, I had game art. And yeah, game art. And I got a video somewhere. Um. Okay. Where did I have this? Name? Gosh, I need to look and downloads. All right. Oh yeah, and here I did a daytime version of it. It's like so cool, I'm like walking through the city, all that. Um, I think I got enough uh, bandwidth on here. Now I made this back in late 2006. Yeah, I even did the music back in early 2007. That's me. Uh, uh, well. Uh, the bass was not me because I didn't have any bass instruments and the drums was and I got like a track and mixed some stuff but all the guitar was me and I wrote it and recorded it and performed the guitar and all that and recorded this thing put it together put together this whole demo we can see the transparency levels for the for the uh, clouds scrolling across the sky I, I got the parallax scrollings uh, going on I drew these bushes I 3D modeled like all this stuff and I got a picture of like some city off the internet and I got the moon there you can see the clouds pass along the moon and then you can see through the clouds a little bit and but keep in mind this recording was done by me in like April of 2007 and the guitar work is all mine so here we go <laughs> see shadows, you see light reflecting off the sidewalk. <clears throat>
All right, well, that was done by me, yeah, five years ago. Oh, <laughs> Diet Martyr. <laughs> oh, yeah, here's a web address. Yeah, Diet Martyr. Oh, Game Project. Yeah, never even <laughs> we got much done on it. Anyway, so that's that. Just uh, my some of my background into this kind of stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, here's... Uh, well, I'm not even going to show you Tom's websites, but, um, because that's, you know, that's not my stuff. It's a neat little website, uh, fashion artwork. It just tells you how to make arcade machines and all that. Oh, I'd love to do that. Yeah, it's totally cool. So, you know, that's the kind of stuff Beeklebotics would, would be doing, uh, as an entity. And then there is, uh, B-A-K-L-E... Botics, Beagle Botics developers. Yeah, it's me. I'm doing all this stuff so far because I got the interest. Uh, checking out the hub to use for on the Raspberry Pi system. Looking at monitors um, and all that. Looking because I'm a hardware person. And um, anyway, um, so that's that. And yeah, get rid of that and. <laughs> This went on forever and ever, um, and with that, and then now I'm, oh yeah, I run Angry Birds, it's a Windows program, but I run it Linux anyway, and I want to show you, finally, get around to showing you how my game works, I just went on to so much stuff, and, um, okay, here's my code here, uh, program code, and this is Genie, I'm using Genie, and it's a really nice program, and a little logo there, so my it looks nice. And you got in here, you just write out all this code in here, and then it's got syntax highlighting. Tom put in the uh, game version, uh, capture and all that. Other than that, a bunch of stuff is mine. He modified it a little bit, uh, but I did all this here based on a tutorial somebody, you know, I've seen on the, on the internet. So what you do is you just you know, you just open and you find your source code and all that. You know how to use program. And you just run, view the current file. And here's uh, Danger from Above. Here's all I got. 7734. You know what that means when you turn it upside down? It means hell. <laughs> and this is literally all you can do is, is just move the bird over top of the cars. And try to crap on him, but he's he's uh, that's a that's how a blue jay really sounds. That's what a blue jay sounds like. I hunted down that sound effect on the internet, and I drew this bird. I drew all this artwork, and it's kind of a little bit slow on here. There's a way to modify the code and make it follow your mouse a little bit better. And if you and that's if you click the left mouse button, that he, he squawks, and he's supposed to drop a turd, and it's supposed to land on cars anyway it's just this is not very much I got done here you click the the center mouse button or also known as a scrolling wheel and the score goes up by 10 points now Tom my friend Tom Porter put that in there and where it says version number danger from above and all that he put that in there um, now you can take a screenshot let's see what is it we, we um, what's the code to capture a screenshot Okay, what do we do? Um, save image, key down, space. Oh, well, we did a space, yeah. Save a screenshot, and it should be in uh, where it should be at. Um, oh gosh. should be in the working directory. Where is this working directory? Um, oh gosh, it would be in, uh, there's only two places it could be. Downloads probably and um, danger from above. Well, we'll in there. Let's see. Uh, run our code. Let's see how that looks. This is the screenshot there. Yeah, 7814 is probably what we did. Yep, 7814. Put the bird right above this tree here. Press the space bar. And, uh, yep, there it is. Just to prove it again, remember that number is 7814. 
Yep, there it is, 8034. Uh, so the screenshot feature is working. And I hit escape. We got that set in there to close the game. And that code for that is it's in the loop somewhere. Um, event type. Um, oh, escape key. Yeah, exits by pressing escape. Got that in there. Now let's speed up this thing. Clock tick. Um, sleep time. Yeah, let, let, let's ditch that. Um, well, let's see. Sleep timer stops the program at 100 milliseconds. Let's set that to set to zero. Let's go 60 frames a second with this thing. Save. Oop. Yeah, did I get this right? Okay. Yeah. Save this. Save that. Run it again. Now, here we go. Notice it runs a lot smoother now. Um, a lot faster. That's because it's um, there's not really any frame limiter. Now, the reason why I had a frame limiter is because it was just system resources on this other system I had. It just really stress it. Let's, uh, while we got this running, open a terminal. That's what I love about Linux Mint. You can just switch desktops and all that. And so you see my script is still running. All that. We top to check out system resource usage. Now this system is a 3 gigahertz Intel Sandy Bridge. That means a second generation quad core i5 processor. And it's using like 17.8% of the CPU resources. Um, that's with all this other stuff. I'm running Kazam to record the screen and all that. And um, yeah, it's still only using like 17% of the CPU's resources. Whereas this same, if this was running like that um, on my old system, that 1.5 gigahertz machine that you see in the motherboard for that had all the TV outputs, it would it would be putting the CPU resource usage above above 50 percent for sure. Probably bring it up to 100 percent because it does. But this is a quad core, so it has more resources than what this program can handle or would even do. We'll still put that frame limiter back in there and uh, sleep timer and. Uh, Anyway, we'll just go ahead and save all that. So that's how you run my um, Pygame script. Just run it in Genie. It'll run.